Welcome to the Enlightened Musician Podcast, a podcast all about the music business and learning how to turn your art into an equally successful business, flipping the mentality of a starving artist into a profitable, sustainable career. Each week, we will interview someone that is excelling in their field and talk tips and tricks on how you can implement that for yourself. Because honestly, how can you know what you don't know until you've been enlightened? All right, you guys, I'm so excited to bring back Dennis Cornell by popular request and the most viewed episode from season one. You guys wanted to hear more about sync. And we just pretty much asked through all social media platforms to send us in questions. And we got a ton back. And we also used a ton of things that we get all the time. So we're going to actually just go through those questions today and have a discussion. It's going to be a little different format, but I'm excited, right, Dennis? I am not excited. Just kidding. <laughs> I am not excited. Nah, but if you guys have listened to the season one episode, you know Dennis has been doing sync for a little while now, and he's had over thousands of placements. So I feel like I have a good person on that's an expert, but also someone that's done both sides, self-representing, working with agencies, working with a plethora of different sync paths. So I feel like we're going to get the best answers for you guys. So yeah, this is going to be exciting. So do you want to just dive into questions? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this is the popular question. Uh, and we want to start off with it, or it's not really even a question. We just want to talk about it first. So I wrote it down. Don't just slide into our DMS with introducing yourself. So what is that about? What is that about? Uh, I think it's, it's strange. It's been just happening more lately. I know. I'll get messages on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. No introduction, not even following me, no communication whatsoever before. And they'll just say, hey, I have beats. Let's collab. Hi, I'm Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, what's your name? I think we talked about it on the first episode. Just be professional. Mm -hmm. No one wants to work with you if you're coming off as being selfish or you're just in it for yourself. Yeah. You know, learn to build a relationship. Well, and that's the interesting thing too, to me, that people think the tactic of literally building no relationship, not even following, adding the person and just sending them. It's like if someone came to your door with Girl Scout cookies and was like, buy cookies. Why are you on my doorstep? Where did you come from? I do like cookies, but no, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just one of those. I think you're right. So I think if everyone, at least from this one thing, because I think this can actually close the door before you even start. Right. Oh, 100%. Kind of, a lot of the times, I'll just delete the message. Oh, I do too. Yeah. What's I the point? Too. Like, if you can't be professional, if you can't introduce, like, cool, if you want to ask if you want to collab, that's cool. But use yourself. Not even a, like, hi, how are you? I'm so-and-so. I do this. It's always, mm -hmm. a lot of the times, it's just like, yo, here's some shit. Take it. Well, that's a good question to ask then. So what would be a cold, I guess, DM that you would answer and think, okay, I'm about this. It's just being personal, really. Like, mm -hmm. do your research. Don't just be like, I see you do sync. So help me. <laughs> you or know? do it for me. Or yeah, That's or do it for me. Or do it for me. That's the thing. I guess part of it too, I came from a different train of thought where mm -hmm. I would try to figure something out myself before I asked people for help. Cause that, to me, that was the only way to learn, you know? And so I think it's just frustrating that everyone wants the immediate answer that they think they need instead of starting at square one. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the, the recent one I got that I actually answered they pretty much wrote to me and said, hey, just saw your new song. It was featured on something. It sounded awesome. I do music in this, this, and this and do production. I don't know if you'd ever be interested, but it could be a cool collaboration if we did a 50-50 split and maybe tried a song for sync. So they already laid their intention out there of, I do this. Here's my authority in the space. I love what you do. And they started with that first. And I would be honored if you ever wanted to collab. If not, no worries. That is probably the most detailed message I've ever was, heard in my life. <laughs> but like I said, you could tell. That's why they have the placements, though. Right, right. And that's why they're doing it. And like when I went to their Instagram, you, it literally had a list of like NBA, blah, 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 like, and it just was like, just I've been on this, this, MTV, blah, blah, blah. 
I was like, okay, like, what's the worst that can happen? You already said it's going to be like a 50 50. We're going to try something out. Like what, what do I have to lose? It's not like a, let's write something. Right. Well, cool. What's the details? Who are you? And it, it was nice that they said like, actually like what you do. They didn't just, you know, so yeah. that separated it a little bit. And I think that's a good point. I think a lot of people don't know what they actually want. So they're, mm-hmm. not, they're not, there's no intention in what they're trying to do. They're just, they think sync is the cool thing now. And so they're just reaching out to people without really knowing what that involves or how they can be of service to someone. I guess that's, that's the thing. It. That's the perfect thing is that you need to find a way to be of service to someone. You want to make someone's life easier, you know? And if you're just being very broad and vague, I don't have the time to figure out how I can help you or, (laughs) right. I I don't even know how to help myself half the time, you know, like. (laughs) You don't want to work with someone that gives you more work. Right, exactly. Your plate's already full. That's crazy. And that's been the thing too, not even just DM to collab. I've recently got a lot whenever I land a spot that people write me and I don't know if you're in the same way where they go, how'd you do that? Who'd you, who was it? Who'd you work when? With? Right. Who'd you, yeah. And honestly, I don't think that's the way to do it. Like I said, if you establish your relationships, these are people that are going to be close to you. You'll find out who they worked with. If it was self-pitch, if it was through agency, whatnot. I think people are, we're in a generation where we think, fast and immediate you ask you get the you know like right. that's reserved for friends so make friends like yeah. i think everyone in the industry likes having friends <laughs> yeah, i mean it's a it's a lonely industry i mean even the yeah. even the music supervisors and the library owners and the sync agents all we're doing all day is sitting in front of a computer by ourselves mm-hmm. you know people want friends i mean life in general people want friends people want people that they can communicate with so be someone's friend first yeah. before you ask. Yeah. And I think this is a good thing to talk about because this is the initial reason why we kind of did this episode was because of getting, we want people to start off on the right foot and not completely just shut doors for them in their face. So that's been the first thing has been the new revelation of the sliding into the DMs and asking just like bombardment of questions without establishing a relationship. Is there anything else you want to say on that before I actually will really go into a little bit more of some of the processes of sync in general. Yeah, no, not really. I mean, I, I am, and I'm sure like you are, I'm always up to help someone. You of course, yeah. to know what you want. Mm-hmm. You know, I have no problems answering questions. I have no problems pointing you in certain directions based on your music, but you have to cut through the noise and you have to give me a reason to want to help you. Yeah. And honestly, just adding a little empathy into it. I'm a sucker for that. You are too. I think that's just being a genuine human being. That's why I started the podcast. I want to help people. I just don't have the time to individually sit with people. But yeah, I think you're the same way. We're both open to questions. Just make sure you kind of come with the right foot forward and ask the right things and have some of your research and start there and get to the next step by asking us a question kind of thing. So I love that. So let's, let's go into the questions. Let's start helping some of these questions we've gotten our DMs. You ready? Do it. All right. So one of the standard questions, what makes a song sync ready? What makes a song sync ready? I mean, there's so if we're talking about songs, you know, obviously lyrical themes help. Mm -hmm. So there's certain topics that work the best for ads. There's certain topics that work for TV shows. And you don't want to be too specific, you know, like you don't want to say I'm walking down Marshall Boulevard, smoking a cigarette with a old English 40 in my hand type. You know? <laughs> That's real specific. What song did you write? <laughs> but, you know, saying those specific things, names, places, time, times a day, or, you know, that kind of depends, you know, that's going to limit your chances of getting synced. Now that song can only be synced in a show that's on Marshall Boulevard or Mm -hmm. the guy that's drinking on the street, you know? So it's things like that where you kind of want to just be aware. And I think, you know, people think that you have to write a certain way for sync. 
you don't have to be this completely different person than you are when you do non-sync related stuff. You just have to be more general. You can still convey an emotion. You can still say certain things. You can still connect with people without being specific. Yeah. And recently what I've done too, because if people struggle with this, write the lyric and then go back and comb through and self-evaluate what's just too specific and change that one or two words and make it more broad. You know what I mean? Like two o'clock versus night are way different things. You know what I mean? The nighttime versus, but that also pigeonholes you too, where it'd have to be a night nighttime scene. So you just got to know you're actually setting up a scene. You're setting up an ad. So whatever you're saying has to be to picture. And I think people don't put those two together because they're like, well, why can't I do that? Oh, I mean, yeah. Research is your best friend. There's Tune Find and there's iSpot.tv. Mm -hmm. Find your favorite brand. Find your favorite TV show. Search it on one of those things and just listen to what people are using. And that'll mm -hmm. give you an idea of genre or structure or topics. You know, that'll really help open the door and I think give you a better understanding of what people are looking for. Well, and that's the thing too. I don't think a lot of people think about, they think their song first and then pitch it to what they want to pitch it to instead of the reverse of, Hey, I watch Nancy drew and it's all very mysterious music. That's like high intensity and dark. I, just because you like the show doesn't mean that your song's going to work on it. So sometimes like I know me, especially I write towards the actual brand or the actual show and kind of make songs that work for that. So a lot of times also thinking about your songs, where it could place will make it sync. Right? Thinking about the show, the trailer first. I don't know. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's the best way to do it. Like you said, just reverse engineering everything and understanding what the goal is before mm -hmm. you start something is going to help you get you to where you need to go instead of just making something and then finding something for it. Cause what if you made something that, no one really uses. I always make the example of making Swedish death metal polka, you know, like, cool, that's what you like to make. But like, you have to understand that your chances of that getting synced is going to be slim. So, but if you did your research and you found a TV show that did Swedish death metal polka, then cool, you're, now you know you can make that music and it'll, yeah. like, you have a chance of getting synced. People get too hard on this because their songs aren't getting synced. Mm -hmm. But that's because they're making the song and then trying to find a home for it. Yeah. Be looking for the home and then making a child that fits that home. Yeah. And we'll talk about this later too, but you see the same reoccurring genres, the same occurring themes. If you look at Taco Bell's commercial, they're going to have the same style song for everything. So don't pitch your singer songwriter song to Taco Bell because that's not what they tend to place. I mean, there might be a wild card, but like you were saying, if you go and just listen to everything, it's not that, you know what I mean? So it's doing your research and not getting disappointed when you're shooting at an era that's not having a target. Like, you know, just, yeah. it's not going to work. Let's see. Do we have anything else with making a song sync ready? Because there's a couple other questions we have that's going to explain a lot more of the details of the song. Okay, let's just go on then. Okay. Okay. This one was such a... A good question. And I know Joe asked it, uh, a friend of ours. Aside from making great music, what are some things one can do to really stand out and sync? And we I, talk about this all the time. I think we, we kind of talked about it earlier, but be learn to be of service to people. It's not about you. I mean, it is about you, obviously, because it's your music, but like <laughs> you <laughs> you can't you can't make it about you all the time. Mm -hmm. Make people's lives easier. We've Lauren and I have talked about this before. We go the extra mile. An agency that I work with the other day commented, she, I just started working with her, and she commented about how amazing it was that I provided her a spreadsheet, yep. all of my information on it. And she said, no one ever does that. And I was like, how does no one ever do that? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's insane because we're in the same boat. I work with a couple of agencies that they literally take every song I send, mainly for the fact, one, I do all the work for them. Like, who would best know my catalog than me? Right. So like you were saying, we have the spreadsheets, the Schedule A's, which pretty much just states the song title, the release date, the metadata, 
who is the songwriters, who's the publisher, their moods, their lyrics. Like it just literally is a detailed sheet that all they have to do is then copy and paste it into whatever they're using because most do disco, but then some use other different formats. But all they have to do is just copy and paste. Like it has the BPM and it has the key. So like they're doing no work. I've already done their work. Also recently because I was doing it, one other company was like, hey, can you just do the song descriptions and lyric sheets for us too? Because we'll get your song in the catalog faster. And that's the thing too. You're you're helping yourself as well just by being a kind person, but they're getting your song into their catalog and their rotation of what they're pitching faster. Yeah. So just think if someone sent you 20 songs and I've been in that boat and they don't send any of the information, you get to it when you get to it. And if you're busy, right. it could be months, Never. months. <laughs> Um, but I know with this, this same company, because one of the other people I know does not do what we do and does not fill a schedule A out, doesn't do whatever. And she denies a lot of their songs and says, just go ahead and let Lauren send it because we work together. Oops. <laughs> let, me, let me point that out, though. But that's the thing. It's, it's just that one step yeah. of being over the top. Yeah. Not even, yeah. But just but extra, like you're hearing. Yeah. The extra five minutes of work you're doing makes their job exponentially better. And like Lauren, mm -hmm. said, yeah, it's going to get in the catalog quicker because they don't have to do the work. All they have to do is upload it into their system, copy and paste the metadata and it's live. And so now you've given yourself three months, uh, your music's now in the catalog three months earlier than it probably should have been. Well, and that's the thing too. Recently, I even just asked, I've been working with another company, just another one. I said, what could I do when I'm tagging and doing metadata for your songs that specifically would help your system better? And they actually had just told me within the release uh, release date, because a lot of times in disco, they need something that's unreleased and they don't have that in one of the, the columns. So she said for the date, if you just type 1111, that would really help. Guess what I do now? It goes above and beyond. And it also shows that you listened. Yeah, that's you know? a good point. That's something I do too. Don't feel afraid or stupid to ask a question like that. Find out what you can do to help them. Don't guess. When they, a company that I work with too, is just like, I'll, I, when I first started working with, I submitted something to them and they were like, oh, can you do this? And I was like, okay, well, do you want me to do this going forward before I start submitting this stuff to you? And, she's, and she was just like, yes, please. That would make my life easier. I was like, okay, cool. Done. Yeah. You've taken then, out half the you know, I have a spreadsheet or I have a document for each of the companies I work with and their mm -hmm. specific way that they want their submissions. Exactly. I'm the same way. If you guys ever want to, I just have a separate email that's a drive folder that only has my sync schedule A's and the way they need them sent out and like the instructions so I don't get it messed up and it's very well organized. So I literally just copy and paste that template each time and send it exactly how they want it. So whenever I send an email, they open it within Hour, the more I've done that. So it's just, it's just insane to me, but it's because you're asking the right questions. You're not asking the me, me, me questions. You're asking for them. Yeah. So you, have to, you have to know how to be on the top of their mind without being forceful about it, without being annoying about it. And that's the way to do it. If you're easy to work with, they're going to want to come to you. Obviously your music matters, but they're going to think about you when those last minute opportunities come up, you know, exactly. because you, they know how easy it is to work with you. And I will say one other thing that's a little different, but in the same category that I think makes, and me and you both probably stand out with that. After you build a relationship with that catalog, I start talking a little bit more as if I'm a person and they're a person. Yep. So I'll, I'll put jokes or I'll start putting the little emoji. I, I start becoming more of my personality because I'm establishing we're becoming friends you know, and not that this is just a working relationship it's because I, I do genuinely want to become friends with these people because like we're all kind of in the same industry. So I think one good thing is start treating them like a friend, like not in the first email, please don't. But like <laughs> by the time you've established a relationship, they've said, Hey, you're killing it. We're loving the schedule A is like, we want to work with you. When they say something, you can crack a little joke. You could, you know. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I do the same thing. Like after a few emails or a few back and forth and I get it and I start to get a feel for that person, mm -hmm. I try to crack a joke or I try to be silly and I try to be funny because 
you're communicating via email. You don't know how their day is. Maybe that little joke, or maybe that little, you know, gif or whatever, like changes their day. You know? Oh yeah, I love gifts. Just yeah. sending like that. You're the best. Yeah. Like, just to soften the blow of trying to become more personable, but it just makes it a lot easier for them just to email real fast, and it feels. Because that's the thing too. I think sometimes when people know they have to do a formal email and write back. It's like, I'll do that later. But if they know they can literally just pick up their phone and respond on Messenger, you know, or just text. Because a lot of them now, I have a couple supervisors that text me now. Because I was like, feel free. I don't care. And they know I'm not going to like just share their email or text or anything anywhere. It's like, (laughs) up to Dennis. And I'm just kidding. We work work a lot together. So it's pretty much shared anyway. (laughs) But, But yeah, I just think those are two things for me that I've seen that just really put me above everyone else and I know you're in the same boat and we talk about it all the time and it's just things that no one's doing or willing to do and I genuinely do not understand why so and, and all, all it is is an extra five or ten percent yeah it's not it's not like I'm doubling my workload by being indispensable I'm literally doing nothing mm-hmm. except for an extra five ten percent yeah. And another thing too, um, cause I had, I just had dealt with something like this. Cause one of the supervisors was telling me, keep track of what you sent them and don't resend them the same thing. Yes. Like keep track. Please, please, please. You can make a spreadsheet. You can make an air table. As soon as you send something, type in sent. Right. When it's approved, type in approved. Because I think a lot of times they're like, Hey, did I send this to you already? Do not do that. I was talking to someone the other day and they were just talking about how it just made them not want to work with them anymore. Cause again, the giving more work, like yeah. you are your own employee, employer, boss, like act like one. <laughs> like, I just felt so bad for them. I was like, I'm so sorry. And that's, that's and that's the funny thing. Just cause you're in a creative industry doesn't mean there's different rules. Yeah. You would never in a day job, Ask your boss what <laughs> you did or didn't do. You know, like <laughs> it's, it's you. something to think about, right? You know, like why is why is it okay to do it in the music industry, but it's not okay to do in any other industry? Like it just it doesn't make sense. So it like, doesn't. just keep that in mind. Whether you have a day job or not right now, would you have done that in your day job if you had one or still have one? That's or, true. Or like, how do you what did you do to get your bonus? You know, you're gonna do that in your day job and you want to go in above and beyond so you can get a promotion or a bonus, do that in music. Such a good tip. Honestly, people don't treat them the same. It's, it's crazy to me, but yeah, it's easy. It's easy just to be a little bit, a step above everybody else because no one else is doing more than the bare minimum. And you would think it's different. It's not. It's crazy. Anyway, next question. Next question. All right. This one's a two-parter. What licensing company should I work with? Should I go straight to music supervisors? What is the difference? So I think this is talking about licensing companies, libraries, music supervisors. What's the route? The route is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, elaborate. I mean, I mean that's the truth. No, like, everyone wants, I, like we said before, everyone wants the easy answer. There is no easy answer. I can give you a million companies like Crucial Music or Jingle Punks or, you know, whatever. But if you don't make the kind of music that they service, then what's the point of me giving you that recommendation? And then yeah. now you hate me or you hate yourself because you can't get music plays. But it <laughs> simply, yeah, but it, it simply could be because you don't make the right music for that company. Mm-hmm. And now you're talking trash about these companies that are getting everyone else a ton of placements because you're not making the right music. Oh my gosh, side note on that. It's interesting for us. We're in a whole bunch of different sync groups and like Crucial is one of those and they've gotten me multiple placements and multiple custom work. And I'm just like, they doing just fine for me. And they say like, they never take any of my music. They have like 30 songs of mine. So I think you're right. It's sometimes when you're pitching the wrong thing or you're just shooting your arrows towards every licensing company, that ain't it. So how do you find the right people? So, I mean, for you personally, the way I did it when I first started, well, the way I do it now still is Google, Instagram, LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. you know, Google sync agent or sync agency or music library or music licensing company, any of those. And 
you have to do the research. You have to go to each of these people's pages, find out what kind of stuff they service. Is it ads? Is it TV? Is it promos? Is it trailers? And then narrow it down. Look at those placements. Once you find out what shows are getting placed on, or if you have access to their catalog, some do and some don't, you know, Mm -hmm. listen to their catalogs and see what kind of music they're making and what kind of stuff they're making. And then you'll find out whether you're a fit or not. Yeah. And someone did ask, what is, what's the big difference between an agent versus a library or is there much? So the way I make my distinction, I, a sync agent usually only takes upfront money. You get to keep all the publishing. You get to keep all the back end. The song's not retitled. With libraries, all the libraries I've ever worked with, they take the publishing side. So if it's not exclusive, they'll retitle it. If it's exclusive, obviously they don't retitle it, but they collect the publishing and then you keep the writer's share. Yeah. And just, they're they're just different ways of doing it. So just do your research and see which one fits better for you. I do want to talk about going straight to a music supervisor. For me personally, if you're just getting in the game, don't do that. Don't do it. Don't do it. They will block you. Not even with a flinch. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But Uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, don't, don't do it. Yeah. Just don't do it. Find ways to meet them in person, whether that's going to conferences or stalking them on Instagram. I don't know. Find out where they hang out. Do whatever you can. Meet them in person. A lot of them, one of the music supervisors I had met at a conference, I was in their town one day and I hit them up and I was like, hey, I'll be in your town. I'd love to get coffee, grab lunch, whatever you're, whatever you have time for, you know? And so I met with him. And one of the first things he said to me is, I very rarely place music for people that I've never talked to. Yeah. So, I mean, it goes back to that friendship thing, that relationship thing that we were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Develop that friendship. Don't even, if you are going to approach music suppliers, don't go, here's my music on the first email. Find a way to build a relationship with them. And maybe that's true as well. Just become friends with some of these people be at the same places they are whenever we can be in the same places they are and establish relationships. Don't even put the music forward. Really learn what you're doing within the agencies and with the libraries. There might be a time later when you get to a point where you can, or you've established that relationship enough where that person will contact you, but don't go from one to Beyonce. Like just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not worth it. You're wasting their time. You're wasting your time. Then you're going to get discouraged again. Just, Start with a library or start with a sync agent. Mm-hmm. Learn the ropes from them. A lot of them are willing to help you. If, oh, you're, yeah. if you're a personable person, they're willing to help you. I have a sync agent that I work with, and they're more than happy to ask me to make changes to something because they want it to be the best song that they can represent, but they also know that I'm willing to do it. If I said yeah. no that first time they asked, <laughs> Well, that true is another case in point, be able to adjust. If someone is willing to pitch your music and they just need an adjustment, do it. Do not say no. They don't want you anymore. (laughs) You don't want to work with people that are hard to work with. But yeah, that's a good point in case too. But I think that's one thing too, as speaking on that. You don't want to admit it, but I can admit it. When I first started out in sync, the music that I made then versus what I make now really being in the game and knowing world's different. If I would have sent what I did a couple years ago to a supervisor, that's my first impression. It wouldn't have been a terrible one by any means, but it surely wouldn't have been a knock your socks off impression as if I do it today. Way different. I could do it now. You know what I mean? Like I do. So, (laughs) but (laughs) But I'm just saying, like, I guess for people listening, and I see it in all these forums, do not take advice from people to go straight to the supervisor. Like, just don't. If you're just, that's bad advice. That's really bad advice. And they talk about it when you're on clubhouses and whatever, like different groups, forums that I'm in, and different music supervisor forums that I'm in, they they hate that. They just don't like it. Yeah, You're wasting their time. And the benefit of working, you know, starting with a library or a sync agent is that you'll start, you should start to see briefs. So Mm that will also help you get an idea of what's being used and how it's being used and seeing 
how things are described and mm-hmm. people's needs. And that'll help you grow with your production, with your songs, with your lyrics, whatever, you know, too. And that's just part of you need to be able to experience those things mm-hmm. so that you know for future reference. Yep. Agreed. Okay. Anything else on that? I'll move on to the next Let's one. Let's move on. All right. So this is another two-parter. How do I submit to companies and what's the email process? Because some companies are not email process. So let's start with that. How do I submit to companies? It's so dumb. we're talking about, <laughs> that's what I was just saying. Like there's, there's so many ways. So what, what's the ways you can submit? What's some different scenarios? Let's go with that question. I mean, a lot of it is via email. So you just kind of have to dig through that company's website and see if they have a submission process, they'll tell you. They'll tell you how they want their music, whether it's disco or email or whatever else. You got to pay attention. Do it how they want it. Or Mm -hmm. else, we said earlier with music supervisors, you'll probably get blocked. And side note on that, this was one thing I saw the other day, and it was with one of the supervision forums that I'm in. Do not find their personal email. Oh, yes. (laughs) Please, for the love of everything, do not go on to... LinkedIn are one of these little bot sites. Don't you do it and send to their personal email. Go on their website, as Dennis said, will tell you how they want to be contacted. And if you don't contact that way, it's just kind of like when someone doesn't follow the rules and dives into the pool. Like I said, don't, you know, I mean, like it's just you've already made a really bad impression. It might take a little bit of time and they might not respond to you right away, you know, and that being the case too, don't follow up every five seconds. I've had people do that where they send me an email every other day to see if I've checked out something. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, there's a difference. There's a very <laughs> fine line of being persistent and being annoying. And obviously oh everyone's different and you're just going to have to figure that out. Like there's nothing wrong with following up with a, oh, no. a library or a sync agent, but know that fine line. Don't like, of course, like said, don't follow up every day. They don't have time for that. Also, depending on how they sort their emails, if they're sorting it from like latest date or, you know, furthest back to most recent, you're going to continue to push your email to the bottom of that list. Because now if their most recent is last, you're now their most recent email again. Yeah. Well, and that's the case too, which some of these companies, they have submissions email before you even pass the plethora of being in their catalog with a personal email so I know some people like you go through the the submission it takes a little bit of time because again everyone and their mother is wanting to get into sync now so they have a whole entire thing to get through but after you kind of cross the tape and you become this person you'll be added probably to one of the reps and they check that email first and you know they don't have as much in that email I know that's been kind of for me sometimes it's a long process to wait to even get into the door but don't try to take shortcuts or use emails that weren't given to you like just yeah, yeah. Not Patience cool. is everything. Patience is everything yeah. in this industry. You have to know that you're not going to get a response the next day or maybe even the next week, maybe even the next month. You know, I, unless, it's very common. For whatever reason, you have exactly what they're looking for and mm-hmm. they have an opt for it, you probably won't get a response. Yeah, and that's one reason why you got to make your titles pretty good. So, like, if they did need something like a dark pop song that sounded like Billie Eilish and you heard it on a, a conference, make sure your title says like Dart Pop Billie Eilish. You mentioned it on this chat or, you know, obviously make it a lot wittier than that. But yeah, one question I want to ask as far as the submission project, submission process, not project. What do you think about when it says no, not, no, no unsolicited, unsolicited thank you. No <laughs> unsolicited. Like, do you just think who cares that's just there or really respect that? It depends. It de- I, I, mean, I really want to know. I'm it, curious. It, does, it depends. I think there's times where I've definitely sent people emails and that said no unsolicited material and I've gotten a response. But like mm-hmm. we said before, that could have just been because I had what they needed. Yep. Well, I'll be honest. I've done it where I don't send them unsolicited material. I literally just make an intro because I'm not sending them anything unsolicited. And in my signature, I actually have my full one-stop catalog and they've opened it. Yeah. But uh, I didn't. I respected that. So I think there's some like gray areas where you can kind of do it. But you know, and there, and a lot of the times, not that I'm saying that you should do it all the time, but they, they put that there so that they stop people from doing that. Yeah. You know, like, you I think what you said is perfect. It's just an introduction. It's a hi. How are you? Like, I'm so and so, you know, 
I love what you did on this show, or I love what you did on this ad, and then just leave it at that. If you have, like Lauren said, your catalog in your signature, and they thought you were cool enough to check it out, then they'll check it out. Other than that, then you didn't really break the rules per se. Yeah. And I'll be honest, that's my bonus tip for anyone listening. One of the biggest things recently that I did and didn't even think it would actually be something was in my signature, I have my one-stop catalog that's not open to the public. I've had so many people respond back to me or ask for me to be certain things in their catalog because they opened that and could see just some of the newest songs. It's it's just a way of letting because I mean if you send them your whole catalog that's annoying. Yep. But if it feels like it, was, <laughs> if it feels like they just did it because I'm telling you there's a link in your bio it says it and you didn't tell anyone to push it. Everyone wants to push the button. Right. <laughs> and they the do. Button. And it's, I mean, obviously your songs have to be up to par. Right. So I mean just because you have that and they play it, it could also be the turnoff as well if they play it and go like oh this ain't it. <laughs> yeah, put but, your best foot forward if you're gonna do yeah. that. Yeah. But it really is a very smart idea, even if it's just like a little sampler disco link. Ooh, that being said, we'll talk about that. Don't let me forget when we get to that question about sending the right links and not yeah. Dropbox. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but anyway, well, so I guess since we're talking about email submissions, don't even attach happen. anything. Stop don't don't do it. Don't attach anything. Everyone has, you know, you're you're clogging up people's inboxes. And that's a good way to get blocked too, because you're not being respectful of their, you know, email or their property or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Well, and actually too, you know, attachments a lot of times pull you into spam folders. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So especially if it's coming from a foreign email, that mm -hmm. the email address that they've never gotten an email for. Yeah. Well, let's actually talk about that then since we're kind of here. If you are sending your music, what format in the email would you put it in? Because Obviously, disco is number one choice for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it doesn't. So that question gets a lot asked a lot too. like, do I need disco? And I think it kind of depends on who you're approaching. Mm -hmm. If you're approaching a music supervisor, then yeah, use disco. A lot of them use disco. And that's the easiest way for them to get your songs or information. You know, if you're pitching to a library only, then you probably mm -hmm. don't need disco. Something like Box, which is free. As long as they have something where they can preview it, then... Um, and I think that's the difference, the previewing, because like when you do like Dropbox and things like that, you have to download it. Or like, I know one, if your space is full, then you can't open. Like, yeah, it's just annoying. So if they can click it and play it, yeah, the easiest way possible. Yeah, make and sure it's, yeah, make it a no-brainer. It has to be something that they can just click and then hit play as soon as that page loads. If they mm -hmm. have to sign up, or if they have to accept your invitation or any of that kind of weird stuff, don't do it. Yeah. So my advice, and I think you're probably in the same boat, look into disco or look into box. Yeah. Any other options are just kind of, I know some people talk about, I'm not crap. What's that one site? SoundCloud. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why people keep saying that's a good option. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> I'm just like, maybe for PR stuff, but not for this. We're going to talk more about the file formats in a little bit, because that's one of our questions. So I won't dive too far into that, but I definitely want to talk about like, because I know a lot of people sent MP3s and stuff like that. That's a no-no, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's actually go to the next one, because we're talking about the different kind of companies and how to submit to them. There's one thing that you need to consider, and this is the next question. So should you pick exclusive or non-exclusive? And what are their standard deals? What's the difference usually between them? I mean, both. You just kind of, you have to diversify because a lot of exclusive companies have bigger relationships or better relationships or relationships that some of the non-exclusives don't have. When mm -hmm. being on some of those exclusives gives you a step up because now you're being represented by this top sync agent. That's always a good look. But obviously, if you don't have the output to make a ton of music, then maybe the non-exclusive is the way to go and give the exclusives one or two here or there. You really don't know what company is going to work well with you for you until you submit to them. I think you and I talk about this all the time. If I'm not making more music and better music, I shouldn't be doing this. Exactly. Be, like, so you shouldn't be afraid to give 
music to non exclusives you really need to be able to do you know experiment a little bit because what if you stopped yourself from submitting to an exclusive company and they could have been your like cash cow yep you just don't know obviously it depends on the deal mm-hmm. but you can't you know you just don't know yeah i think people ask the wrong question because it's like which one should i do and i think you answered that perfectly if you're able to do the output you should put a little bit here and there I have some songs that are with exclusive that are doing really well. I have songs that are non-exclusive that are doing well. One thing I would point out when that song you pick, if it's exclusive or non-exclusive, it stays there. So if you pick the song to go exclusive, that's it. If it's not exclusive, you ain't converting it to exclusive. Like make your mind up and keep going. As Dennis said, you write better songs, you write more songs and keep going. And I know a lot of the exclusive deals that I have, even if it's a three-year term, if it leaves that term, I guess, or I take it out. I'm going to put it with another exclusive company. I'm just, you know, make it easy. But I think that's, that's the thing. If you can do the output, test everywhere out. And then the one that starts excelling, give them more. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with figuring it out. I think a lot of people are scared because they think they have to do the right thing first. (laughs) Yeah, And you can't. You can't. Yeah. Honestly, you can't. It took me a long time of trying different libraries, of trying different sync agents and doing all these different deals that in hindsight, some of them probably weren't the best. My thought process was always, I'm going to make more music. So who And cares? I think that's what you have to do. And don't get so stuck if the deal didn't work. Well, guess what? You learned something. That deal didn't work and you're not going to do it again. Yeah, like- just because that deal was an exclusive company or a non-exclusive company doesn't mean that every exclusive company is terrible now you exactly. have to be able to like really separate those things and you have to take all of your emotion out of all of this it's you know that's the only way you're really going to survive it in this kind of an industry yeah and i do want to point out because we were talking about this the other day and i don't think this is clarified enough just as a side note when we're talking about exclusive and non-exclusive we're talking about either via the song or the album so I personally would just suggest, unless you're at just a different spot, to never sign yourself as an artist or as an individual songwriter entity as an exclusive deal where you can only go through one company. That is the caveat I wouldn't do starting out. Yeah. Uh, right, that, that's that right? Same, yeah. Definitely, if someone is trying to sign you exclusive as an artist or a songwriter, they have to be top-notch. They have I'm to be totally able to... Good. Not that they can guarantee anything, but they have to be, they have to be in love with you. They have to be in love with you. And already show that they are constantly, weekly, monthly. Getting placements for your kind of music. Otherwise, you just locked yourself into something that you're stuck in for a a couple of years. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that clarification. If people are listening, they're like, cool, I'll sign it. Just make sure that's the caveat that you don't do. Again, some people are with agencies and they're literally getting them placements like every other day go for it if that's the case like they're they're cash cow let them just keep going with that yeah um yeah i mean i would happily sorry i would happily sign myself as an artist to a company if they were getting me place once weekly yeah if it was weekly and they were like big payouts they were ads trail why not yeah so that's the case but if it's not and you've never had a working relationship with them like you wouldn't marry someone you hadn't gone on a date with yet like don't do that a lot of people sign that way. And that, I've seen that recently with a couple of things. So I just wanted to say that. Also, one question we get a lot. What is a standard deal? Like what's a good deal, bad deal when we're talking about how much percentage royalties, publishing, these companies are taking? What's what's like a good deal? So with libraries, it's usually 50-50. 50-50. Mm-hmm. You know, I think anything, if, if any company, if anyone's trying to take more than 50% from you, run away. Right. I mean, yeah. Unless they have some, they have some sort of reason to explain why they should get sixty, and you should get forty. Don't do it. So mm-hmm. yeah, with libraries, it's usually fifty-fifty. You know, like we said before, they take the publisher side. You keep the writer side. Agents, I've seen anything from twenty-five to fifty percent, and that's usually just the upfront. And you, and you keep the, the back end. Yeah, you keep all the back end royalties. So those are kind of standard things we've I've seen. You definitely, I've seen this a lot too, where 
people are offering to pay you like 50 to 100 bucks for your song and they buy you out completely. So you get nothing other than that 50 to 100 bucks. No future royalties, no upfront money. It's exclusive. So just be very careful. Hire a lawyer if you have to for the first couple of times until you get to like really understand what these contracts mean. Mm -hmm. You know, one little word can change the whole meaning of a, of a paragraph. Mm -hmm. So unless you understand what that word and the arrangement of that sentence really means, you could be screwing yourself out of tons of money. Yeah. And I agree with you with, I've seen some of the buyout things and then certain networks that are kind of doing that as well, trying to collect all the back end as well up front. Just be aware of what your worth is and make sure that you're not selling your songs for 50 and a hundred dollars and getting nothing else. That's a good point too. That, that has become a trend where a lot of production companies want to own the publishing publisher side of the royalties. So what libraries are doing not all of them, some of them are starting to do is that they now want to take part of your writer's share mm -hmm. so that they can make their money, obviously. And just don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. And the more we don't do that, the faster that'll go away. But people yeah. are getting desperate and they'll do it because they think they're going to make money. It's not worth yeah, it. I think it's only, was it Discovery, Discovery. and... There's only been like one or two, but the composers like stood up. So as, as he's saying, like, as long as you stamp and go, no, 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 no. Because we don't want to make that a trend. So everybody, <laughs> not make that a trend. I mean, music is already the last thought in the whole production process of a mm -hmm. show or a movie or whatever. And so the budgets are way smaller than they should be, unless there's someone in that production company that's fighting for the music and fighting for the artists to get paid more. I agree. So we've talked a lot about what we should email, what we should do. Let's actually dive more into the song. So this is a three-part question. Actually, I'm going to ask the first two parts okay. of it. Um, so what kind of music works for sync and what genres do well or don't do well? Uh, you know, Swedish death metal polka. I'm telling you, I had someone ask me the other day about metal music. I I don't think I've ever gotten a request for metal music. Metal music works for sports. Oh, so if you're doing instrumental that? stuff, I mean, and that's more instrumental than vocals. Okay, so, we'll see. That makes some sense. Because it's high energy, you know, so that works well for their background music for sports, sports TV shows, sports yeah. in general. So it just kind of depends, like sports, metal, hip hop, you know, an up tempo hip hop and stuff like that. That works great for sports, too. You know, there's I get a ton of requests for like hip hop, R and B kind of style. Like what you were talking about for sports and whatnot, pop, obviously. Let's see. Yeah, like real I mean, all the all the top forty stuff, obviously that works. You know, for reality TV shows like the pop stuff, hip hop, anything dramatic will work for a reality TV show because there's mm -hmm. insane amounts of drama. Yeah, so like <laughs> The one that I always find that's a weird caveat is like country and Americana folk. I feel like certain brands will lean towards that folky American. Like, yeah, like ah! Subaru, like I know Subaru uses it. I think it's Subaru that you, they use a ton of like folky stuff. I think like Ford does as well a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But so, you know, it's like all those all outdoor kinds of ads probably have the best fit for the folk Americana stuff. Yeah. But more than that, it's it's a smaller market. Right. There still is because I know they're they're trying with Netflix. I've seen some for like Virgin River and a couple of those kind of where they're kind of pulling in some of those genres. But I don't think it has as much of a pull as like pop, R&B, hip hop, rock, uh, which even rock. I mean, there's still a good amount, but not as much as those first two. Yeah. From what I've seen. Yeah. Personally. I think for the for rock, it's like it's very TV show specific because like, you know, it's shameless. They're. They're using, they use tons. Of oh, yeah. You know, so they, that, like, it's not as broad. It's definitely not as broad as uh, the pop and hip hop stuff. But but that really goes back to your point of if you make a certain kind of music and that's like your thing, find those TV shows, find the ads, find the trailers that that is what they use it for. Yeah. Um, 
but also don't make pulp pulp music <laughs> exclusively. Well, but you know, going back so going back to that point, like, you know, a friend made a song specifically for Shameless. He had that show in mind and used those like watching that show, he used those topics. He created a theme based on that show and he actually got the show placed on Shameless. So I was say, I wonder if it's the same person I'm yeah. thinking about. Uh, they got two now. Yeah. Yeah. From that same formula. Same formula. Same song. Right. So, <laughs> Different episodes. Right. So it works. Like that's that's a formula. I'm trying to think. So yeah, just the genres. I mean, obviously there is certain times where the just random subgenres come up, but it kind of stays pretty true to those kind of formatted ones. I just wouldn't put all your eggs into like you were talking about the metal uh folk polk whatever. <laughs> Um, yeah, kind of diversify just a little bit and see what's working and kind of just don't go off the beaten path. Do what's working. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's like any industry. If you want, if some obscure genre is your thing, then cool. But understand and have the proper expectations. Yep. No one's forcing you to do anything you don't want to do. Just have the right expectation. Don't think that you're going to land an ad from something obscure yeah so just know where things belong yeah so i think every genre has a place it's just what place is it and how often will that come up and i think that's something we've discussed too kind of on a tangent people always ask oh well what should i give to a sync agent versus a music library versus exclusive or non-exclusive and that's kind of a you thing you have to understand and you have to be objective enough to look at your music and say cool the song's done and it's not my best and maybe it goes to a library you know i know isn't that funny i do the same thing they go (laughs) they go to libraries usually yeah but i mean also just because it isn't your best doesn't mean it won't get synced i've had tons of songs that when Mm -hmm. i started i wasn't really making quote-unquote sync music i was just i was working with different artists and trying to get it licensed after i was done producing it for them you know, and I've gotten those songs played. So you, you, you honestly don't know. You just have to put it out there and let things take its course. And like you said earlier, because I know recently you got a placement that was five years old and it oh, hadn't yeah. gotten a placement from the one TV show or not TV show. It was a Netflix uh, movie. Yeah. The Netflix, uh, Spencer Confidential. Yeah. 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 So also just because it doesn't get placed for five years doesn't mean it's not going to. It's just the right time, right place. Yeah. So I think that's a good thing to say too, because a lot of people get frustrated. It hasn't happened, but it's a long game. It yeah. really is. Yeah, you kind of you have to have that like set it and forget it mentality. Just keep making music and keep doing what you're doing, and it'll happen. You know, well maybe you are. <laughs> you know, you know, a lot of you know when you release a song on streaming services, obviously you want it to do well. But if you're not, you can't brood over it. You can't just mm-hmm. like, why aren't people listening? You, I mean, maybe you're not marketing right. Maybe you're not. You just have to keep doing what you do and doing what you love, and you, the it'll come together. Exactly. Well, let's add the third question onto this. So we're talking about genres. We're talking about uh, what music works. But a lot of people are artists, so they say, "How do I keep my artist personality and still write for sync?" Yeah, I think we kind of touched on that a little earlier, mm-hmm. but it's interesting because I hear this question a lot. I just don't understand. To me, I'm always being true to who I am, Mm -hmm. no matter what genre of music I'm making, there's ways to inject yourself into a song and still make it sync friendly. And I think I'm in the boat. That's one reason I do sync is because I love doing multiple genres. So I have different pseudonyms and I get to do the multiple personalities as I was telling (laughs) Dennis earlier, but I'm authentic to whatever that pseudonym is. Obviously, I kind of divide it up so people aren't confused if like, it's Lauren Light, do 50 genres? No, she does, (laughs) but her other pseudonyms do them. But, you know, every song, I'm not going to let crap go out into the world. Like, it's going to be my best foot forward. And if I wouldn't release it myself, I wouldn't send it somewhere. So I think you just have to check yourself. You know what I mean? You just have to be honest and impartial. You can't baby your songs or yourself. I think that's 
I'm sure you're the same way. I think that's the one thing that separated me from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, once it's done, it's, it's gone. I don't even yep. think about it ever. Exactly. Ever, until it gets placed, you know, cause there's no, there's no point in that. There's no point in wondering if this company is really pitching my music or what's happening with that song. There really is no, there's no point to it. I agree. And I think a lot of times people think if they're not writing as an artist, they're just writing cheesy jingles right. for sync. And that's the wrong way to look at it. If you would be ashamed to show someone, stop writing that song. Yeah. Yeah. And unless it's for a kid's show and you're getting a brief and a commission for it, then it appears. <laughs> but, um, there are real, there are lines, but no, I, th I think like, cause we'll, we'll be writing stuff like, woo, that trying to be vague, you'll get cheesy. Right. Don't fall into that trap. Right. So I think it's easy. Just be authentic to yourself and then just make sure you're not too descriptive. That's, yeah. that's it. And I think people take that vague description too far. They think they have, oh, yeah. they felt when you say vague, you mean you're not saying anything. Yeah. You're completely wrong. Like you still have to convey a message. You still have to convey emotions. We're not here just like, <laughs> hands on a key like a chord for the whole four minutes <laughs> and nothing's happening and then you're just mumbling you have to be able to present all that stuff in a package that sounds like an artist because a lot of music supervisors are sniffing out all that bs now too so if you're mm -hmm. too sync then you're just as bad as being two artists Ooh, i like that you know so you have That's to find that side. People don't talk about that what'd you say so that's the flip side. People don't talk about that. Yeah. Because if you're too cheesy and you're too wholesome, unless obviously it's calling for something wholesome, but then it's just as bad as being too specific. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I think that's the good way to look at it. Okay. So we've talked about this. We haven't talked about the other side of the spectrum. So for everyone that's not an artist and they're a producer and wanting to get different stuff in, how do you structure cues? Let's talk about Q World. So Q World. Uh, Q World, I guess. I don't know. So for me, What's been working is the music has to ebb and flow. I like to have things coming in or out every four to eight bars. You have to remember, this isn't for an artist. So it's got to be able to move and it's got to be able to keep people's attention. So if you think you're overproducing, you're probably not. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because you have to fill that space of a vocal. Oh, gotcha. That makes complete sense. See, I'm not on this side. So this is like all different for me. So I'm excited that you're on here for this. Yeah. Imagine if you listen to a Migos song or a hip hop song that didn't have the vocals on it. It's just a loop. Doom, doom, right. Doom. You know, it's just, so you have to think about that. You have to find ways to, to substitute that vocal. So having it build and drop or instruments coming in and out obviously you need to have something playing some sort of melody to keep it interesting but not too crazy where it would clash with the dialogue that's happening on the show or movie or whatever so those are things to think about and obviously you know you want to have a sting ending you don't want it to just kind of stop properly because you want those you want those pieces you want the drops and the rolls and the sting those are amazing edit points for an editor. So you want those things to help make their job easier. And having that structure of things coming in every four to eight bars and building and stuff like that, that gives them so many different points for them to edit to and to place. So you're just giving yourself more opportunity. And I think this is a good point because I get a lot of people asking me this personal question about cues and I'm this is not my world at all. There really kind of is a format and a template to it. So you can't just send a whole bunch of instrumentals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you start doing it, like I have a template for almost every genre I make. Hmm, so smart. it makes my life easier. One thing I like to say is learn to turn one cue into three. You can use the same chord progressions from one song and make it three different genres by changing the sounds, changing the tempo, changing all of that. And then your output is faster. Which is what you want in the long run. Especially in the Q world. Yeah. It's about, I mean, quality matters, but volume matters a lot too. That's so good to know too. And I think a lot of people really confuse that you're just sending instrumentals. 
Yeah, don't do that. I, I mean, I, that's so the funny thing is, I mean, that was a long time ago when I first started. That's what I was doing because I didn't know any better. The market wasn't as saturated then and things were still getting used. I mean, there's always a chance things will get, still get used, but, you know, a lot of libraries are a lot stricter now. Yeah. So they either tell you to add things so that it moves or they're just not going to accept it. Well, at least if you're listening to this podcast right now, just know that that's your sign to hop on some YouTube figure out what exactly are different structures. And he, he's already talked about some of these. So, I mean, I just think this is a good point for people that are listening to not do the stupid things and learn. And so that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, is there the, any the cues don't need to be more than like usually anywhere between two to three minutes. It mm -hmm. doesn't need to be super long. Obviously don't make it super short unless that's the genre that it, that mm -hmm. calls for it, you know, but yeah. You know, you know, all this, obviously you want to, when you submit those instrumental cues, you want to submit different versions of it. So you submit the main version and then you can submit a drum and bass version or drum and bass only version, or you submit a version without a main melody line, the main melody line, you know, there's different ways. And then they do 60, 30, 15, whatever as well. And those are all things that you might want to submit depending on what their requests are. I always at least submit the drum and bass only version or a, a no melody version because what if a show really likes the groove, but whatever instrument choice you use conflicts with the dialogue. So that's something to keep in mind too. You don't want to have too many sounds that are in that speech frequency because then it's going to distract and people aren't going to want to use it. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. Like if you're in a bar and you're trying to have a really good conversation with someone and you hear, gum, 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 like it's the same thing in a scene as well. And I think that's a good thing to point out. Also to your point, I think it's good to even have a template or a checklist for all the different things that you should send as far as when you're first starting out, yeah. um, the different, so you don't miss any of these, which I think kind of leads into our next question. So um, talking about everything, what are the file formats that you should have on hand for songs because a lot of people send songs and thinks it's okay just to have an MT, MP3 of a song, like one, one MP3 and they just send that for like music. Like that's eh, wrong. Don't do it. I have that a lot. <laughs> just don't do it. <laughs> uh, so let's just start fresh. What, what are the formats and what should you have on hand in case they need it? Yeah. And unless they specifically say they only want an MP3, which I've only seen with a couple libraries that are only that only deal with cues. Um, you always want to have the highest quality possible audio file. So like a wave or an AIF, you always want to have that on hand because especially with songs, they want mm -hmm. the highest quality because you know there's a good chance that it's not being used with dialogue and it's it's standing out on its own, so it's gotta sound good. Um, yeah. I was going to say, and a lot of times they say AIF, but WAVE will work. Yeah. So like if you can do AIF, do it because that holds your metadata. So all that information where they can contact you and actually place the song, you don't want to miss an opportunity just because they couldn't find it and they're unorganized. Because let's be honest, we lose songs and information. Yeah. We don't want that to happen. So AIF, WAVE's okay. Yeah. And then uh, so for like songs, you know, you want the main version, you want an instrumental version mm -hmm. at the very least. Obviously, if, it's explicit, if there's explicit lyrics, you want a clean version. And what I do and what I started getting in the habit of was as soon as a song has been finished, I bounce the stems out and I group them based on the instrument. So, you know, percussions, one track, bass, one track, and then I break down the instrument. So synths, guitars, whatever, and then vocal. Mm -hmm. And then if there's a lot of background vocals, I separate the vocals even more so that it's like a vocal main and a vocal background. Smart. And I think that's really good, especially the thing I've had the most is like bands that go into a studio and they only got the main. And so they're trying to pitch this and th that should be that checklist that you bring into the studio as well with your split sheets and all the, the rights organization for the song so that you get all that stuff. So when it's asked, because a lot of times like stems, like Dennis is talking about, they'll say we need it within an hour or two. Yeah. I've had that happen more than once. It's like, oh, great. so I actually have it in a zip folder via Dennis's suggestion in Disco. And I just have it. So whenever they need because you never open those, you just send the whole thing. So it's just nice to already have prepped and ready, which also makes supervisors so 
impressed your licensing agencies when you can send them the stems within like five minutes. Yeah. I mean, like, that whoa. Happened, that happened to that happened to me yesterday when we I know we were on the phone about the phone, it. And I was like, hey, I have to stop real quick. <laughs> and I sent it and he replied back, like I sent it within five minutes of him sending it. And he replied mm-hmm. immediately. He was just like, oh my God, you're amazing. That was so fast. So to be able to have that available is just like such a gem and people love you for it. When it's funny too, one of the, two of the bigger placements that I've gotten, the one I was in New York City out and about when I was asked for stems. So like I had to, good thing I had it already prepped. I was not even in home. The second one, I was actually in a Longhorn when they said we need them within an hour. But I mean, I could have lost the placement. Right. Yeah. So it happened to me on, on, on another one too. Actually, I was out of town mm-hmm. and they were like, can you get stems for this? And I was like, I'll look and see if you really need it. I can see what I can do. And I've set up my main studio computer that I can access it anywhere. So it was such an old track that I didn't have stems for it. But because I could access my computer mm-hmm. from far away on another laptop, I was able to bounce those stems out. Smart. So you got to have yourself covered. But also to point out, you need all these stuff. But don't send that in your email. Only send them, I usually send the main and the instrumental collapsed. Keep the stems on file that you easily can send it. Don't send them that in your initial email. Unless they're asking for it, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, Just have it ready. So this is especially good for people that don't have a close relationship with their producer or not the producer. Me and Dennis, all the stuff we do, I don't keep the stems. Like you're the only producer I don't, but I know five seconds, he's going to email it the same amount that I would. So that's one reason too, working with people that you truly trust as if you were trusting yourself. But yeah, just having those files in order, I think it's good to have like a little checklist while you're first starting out. Cause we've kind of gotten used to this and knowing kind of what you need, but just having that checklist when you go into the studio, you're doing a write online that you make sure you get all these formats together. One thing we were talking about, because it's on this part of the question, which a lot of the people that are listening probably know, but some people might not. What is a one stop? And that's good to have when you're having a song. Yeah. I mean, one stop is basically saying that only one person that's associated with that song needs to clear it or can clear it. That one person can clear it without getting the permission of the others to use a song. And obviously that makes everyone's lives easier because you don't have to chase everyone down to get a song license. Cause like, what if, you know, Lauren and I worked on a song, but we don't really know each other. And then, you know, I, it happens though. It happens though. Like I pitch it and then the music's like, it's not one stop. So now they have to chase it, especially for TV shows, their deadlines are so tight. So it's not one stop and they have to clear it with all the parties and they can't, you're done off to the next yeah. song. Well, and that's easily fixed. The only exception is if one of your writers has a publishing entity, like if they're with Sony, it's just never going to be a one stop because you're with a publishing entity. But let's just take that. Let's just pretend like everyone is writers. They're all self-published, whatever. All you have to do is on your split sheet, make a little additional terms and just give permission. I know on mine, it says for all non-exclusive agreements, each party is non-exclusive or this person is the one stop. Done. Yeah. You have the, you have the right. So from then moving forward, you don't have to worry about You it. have proof. Yeah. It's easy. It's just like you said, with the first thing, the checklist, like getting it when you're done with the song, like get that done when you're packaging up the song, making it ready, tying it with a bow. Make sure all that's ready. So that's a good thing, especially when you're emailing the different companies. They A lot of companies want one-stop songs only. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask or to present that kind of stuff to the split sheets and stuff like that to people. If if someone yeah. doesn't want to sign a split sheet, that's probably something you want ah. to with. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that. And also, if you know it's not one-stop, don't ever tell someone something's one-stop if you're confused if it is or not. Find that out. You will get cut out of the industry really fast. Oh, yeah, if- yeah. That's no, no bueno. So I think that's all about that. We ju- I just want to touch on that because I know some people here are very versed with what one stop is. And some people are like, who's stop? This is one that's asked a lot. Do I need to be in a music city? No. <laughs> don't do it. I mean, no, I mean, I'm not going to say don't do it. It depends. I mean, it depends on what you're looking for. If sync is the only thing you do, then you don't need to be in a music city. Wow. If- I think 
is it a requirement to be able to be successful in sync to be a music city is kind of the question. And it's not. No, I built my sync career, even though I was in a music city, I built my, I built my sync career by emailing people. I emailed people for five years, on, like only emailing people. Mm-hmm. They, had, they didn't care where I lived. They just cared that I was able to deliver what they want. Exactly. You know? And go ahead. I was going to say, a lot of people think I live in Los Angeles. They just assume. But because I, I fly out there and whatnot, like, and I meet people about the same amount, because like networking events, you can fly out there and you're actually saving money because I'm in North Carolina. I have so many people think I'm in Los Angeles and I always like schedule PST time and I don't correct them. I just, you know, just let them schedule whatever time they want. Uh, it works out usually better for me because it's later. <laughs> So, but I've had no problem not being in a music city. And actually I have a little bit more money and I can record in the country and have no noise and no, so I mean, I'm kind of like, it's not an issue. So I think that's a good answer. Yeah, That's a caveat. It's not, I mean, yeah, unless you, unless you're planning on doing lots of live shows, which obviously you're not doing right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> True. Unless your plan is to be doing live shows all the time or. You also want to be signed to a deal, like a a music label deal, then there's no real reason to be. Yeah, there's a chance you could meet someone on the street or in a bar or whatever. Like, no. No. (laughs) For what you're saving, not being in a music city, you know, like Lauren said, you can go to those music cities whenever you want visit them more like obviously not now during COVID, but instead I took that budget and made sure that I could go and really, I think it actually is better because when I'm there for like the two week span of time, I plan that whole entire two weeks very meticulously. I don't know if I lived there, if it would be as meticulous and as like structured and thought out. Oh, for sure. Um, I think, you know, when I was living in LA and Hollywood, you kind of just get comfortable and you get complacent and you're like, yeah, whatever. Next one. You know, isn't that crazy? Yeah, I mean, it's just it is. But like you said, when you when you're coming from out of town, you want it to be as productive as possible. So you're thinking about it ahead of time. You're trying to set up these things. You're trying to do all these things, and you want to make the best of it. So I think it's not necessary if you understand how to use the internet. It's not. <laughs> well, I, mean, I hate to say it. That's true. Some people don't. So. <laughs> if you understand those little nuances and aspects of being able to find companies and people and stuff that are in different cities, then you don't need to be in LA. Does that mean because I want to work with companies in the UK, I have to move to the UK? No, you just find them. That's the truth. And I've had a lot of success in like Australia and UK and different companies there, especially for even like over radio play and like the, oh, yeah. the business. Like, I, you're right. I don't need to move there. I don't need to move to Russia because my songs are doing well. It makes no sense. So I'm glad you point that out. I have a lot of songs in Turkey right now, too. <laughs> Randomly. Ah, Turkey. So, <laughs> it makes no sense. But, but you know what I'm saying? I don't know where this process has gotten into people's head. Obviously, there are certain career paths if you have to physically be in person. But as far as sync goes, if you're writing the songs, pitching the songs, unless you're like the composer and you're wanting, they're wanting an end staff. There is no reason. Yeah. And you know, to that point too, we'll get requests for regional artists. I never get requests for people that are in LA. (laughs) Oh no, you never do. do. (laughs) Or New York. I've seen a bunch of requests for things that are outside of the major cities. New Orleans been a lot. I've seen New Orleans a lot. Yeah those areas a lot i know and i know recently they're doing one for the appalachian area and north carolina and the hills i was like okay that's random obviously i don't do any of that kind of music even though i live here but it's just you're right so i think that when people try to say i can't do it until i can move to la or nashville or new york the only person in your way is you that's that's not an excuse so i think that's also a positive thing too you can start now like don't don't play that game yeah i think that that's a big thing too. You know, a lot of people they make excuses or they try to find they think that they're not ready. You're mm-hmm. never gonna be ready because you haven't experienced it. So you need to just start so that you can learn. You can't learn unless especially in sync, you're not gonna learn unless you do. You can study all you want. But if you're not seeing those breeze. If you're not interacting with these people, if you're not building those relationships, 
you're never really going to progress. Yeah. It doesn't matter your location. I agree. I love that. And we needed to talk about that. Here's the next question. I don't get to ask this one as much, but I know you do. Do you need a manager? No. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, easy enough. It's easy enough. Like I, I don't, I, it's, I mean, it goes back to the, it's, it's almost the same thing as the music city thing. The only time you need a manager is if you're doing so much. And if you have a team of producers underneath you or a team of artists or a team of songwriters, you don't need a manager unless there's so much work that you can't do it yourself. Or unless that manager's so plugged in and they're able to get you those like really great placements, there's no point. And my big thing too is and what I always tell people is that you don't want a manager right now, especially if you're just starting out. I don't want a manager now because I want to be able to learn and understand every aspect so that I never get screwed. Yeah. And someone else is still controlling your career at a point that you're fully capable of doing it yourself. If not, maybe you shouldn't be in this career. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's true. You have to be able to take control of your own situation. You can't expect someone to change your life for you. Yeah. Again, as to Dennis's point, though, if you're to a point and you've leveled up and you have so much on your plate and you've gotten to the point, yes. But until then, don't even have that on your radar. Yeah. I mean, the thing, too, is on the same token, on like to play devil's, devil's advocate on that, too. If you're doing too much where you think you need a manager, that could also be a point in looking at what's actually working for you. Because you're doing all this stuff because you think you need to, and only the small portion of stuff is really what's bringing in your money. Maybe you just don't do all that other stuff. That's really smart too. We were talking about that the other day too. Sometimes see what's working for you because I think it's good to test everything. We were even talking about that with certain companies you're working with, certain songs you're kind of doing. What keeps getting asked for and stop putting your 80% into certain things that aren't the 20% that's killing the game. Right. Like, Yeah, I mean, when sync agents are replying to you out of the blue and telling you how much they love your song, yeah, for n absolutely no reason other than to tell you that they love your song, maybe we had should that make more of those songs. <laughs> <laughs> we had that the other day and we kind of tested out a new kind of, well, I mean, it was still in our genre, but just adding some different production elements and it was just kind of out of the blue and they're a big agency. So we're just like, okay, but yeah, just keep doing what's working. Stop. I think that's a very good point. Stop doing extra things that just aren't going anywhere. And that's the case with working with certain people. You can be friends with certain people, but if it's not going anywhere and both of y'all are not benefiting, you know, it's okay to stop doing that kind of stuff and really be laser focused. And I think that could also solve that problem of being overworked as well. Yeah. You know, and we've talked about it too. For me, clearing out that space of doing things that I wasn't having fun with or wasn't passionate about, mm -hmm. what if, for whatever reason, coincidence or not, opened so many more doors and so many more opportunities by creating yeah. that space to allow other things to come in, you know, and doing what I love to do. I'm having more success doing less right now. Isn't that crazy? But I, I'm in the same boat. We had a conversation maybe a la, little la, last year and was just like, I'm going to stop doing things that I do not enjoy. I'm going to stop where even like, I don't hate someone because I don't enjoy this kind of stuff, but like, I'm only going to do things that I'm really good at that keep getting asked for and that I'm having a blast doing. And like you said, when you take things off the shelf that shouldn't really be there, it gives you room for bigger opportunities and you have the space and capacity to take it on. And maybe it's life won't hand you stuff until you have the space to handle it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So great point. All right. So one nitty gritty question last. And I think this is one of the things that everybody just skims right over. So let's just pretend like we're just starting out with sync. What do I need to have set up to make sure I collect all my royalties? You just need to be, just basic. yeah, you just need to be signed up with a uh, performing rights organization in whatever country you're in. So if you're in the U.S., you know, BMI, ASCAP, CSEC. Yeah, without that, you're not getting paid. You're not getting any money, especially if you're doing instrumental cues. Mm -hmm. There's very little upfront for instrumental cues unless it's being used for something big. So mm -hmm. if you're not signed up with an organization collecting your royalties, you're making zero dollars. 
Yeah. And true, they actually, any company will not work with you until you have that set up. That is a good point too. Yeah. So don't even- that information, send- they don't want to work with you. Yeah. So you need to have your IPI number. And then if you're not with like BMI, which BMI, you can have a self-publisher as well, like a vanity publisher. Make sure your ASCAP has a vanity publisher that you can collect both sides of your royalties. And I think that's something people don't, sometimes they only have one entity set up. You know, there are so many YouTube videos that will go into exactly what you need. But I know a lot of people, we were looking at something the other day where they try to sign up for admin publishing deals. Don't do that. Like CD Baby Publishing, stuff like not that they're bad. They're just like, if you're doing sync, you don't need to do it. And it actually sometimes can, you know, lead to some scuffs or roadblocks that just you didn't even need to have there. I think that's more the thing. It's not per se that some of these things are bad. It's just, you don't need them. Yeah. I mean, it goes, it goes back to, you know, making it easy for whoever's taking on your music. If they have to question who, who owns the publishing or something, or if a third party owns the publishing for something, they're going to ask you that first time and then, or they may not even ask you. Yeah. They might just not take it because they don't want to have to go through the legwork of having to prove it every time that song is up for placement. Yeah. And I mean, I see on all these forums all the time where they're trying to add the writing and the publishing up to 200%. And they can't find the random 16% person out there. So like when you're getting all the songs together before you even submit it to anyone, just make sure everything equally adds up. Everybody's names, their PRO, their IPI, their publishing entity, whatever it is, is there. The percentages, like as Dennis said, make it as simplistic as possible. So when you get that placement, you can get paid. All these other things that people advertise, like you just need the PRO as the main thing up front. Everything else is... Yeah, a lot I've of seen, I've, I mean, I've seen in some of the, you know, music supervisor groups that we're in, like, someone lost an ad deal because they couldn't find, I think it was like two and a half percent. And they couldn't, they couldn't clear that two and a half percent. That's devastating. And that shouldn't be, a, that shouldn't even be an issue. Be on top of your stuff. Yeah. So I think that's the only thing with like collecting royalties, unless you can think of anything else. It's I think people make it way too complicated. And it's not that complicated. Just make sure you, you register them. It it doesn't take much. Yeah, it really. Yeah, doesn't. make sure you, especially if you're working with, <laughs> especially if you're working with sync agents, make sure you're registering your songs. Usually, if for BMI at least, like if something comes through and it's it's attached to you but it's not registered to you, they'll register it. But who knows if they're doing that all the time? Why leave it on someone else to maybe do the work properly when you can just do it yourself? Yeah, I think it's just the case before, I think have all your checklist items checked off for your song. Make sure that your song is the correct formats. You have all the correct file types. You have all the correct stems. You have your metadata filled out, which we didn't talk about, but feel free to just look up metadata. Like I actually did talk about some of the things you need in the song earlier in the episode and make sure that your royalties are set up before you even email anyone with these songs. Like just yeah. all the stuff we talked about before, before all this is taken care of, don't even think about it. Yeah. And if you need to on your first ones, like you were talking about, ask someone if everything's right on some of your first goes before you email them, you want to have your best foot forward. And I know there's people in your community, as long as you are trying and not just letting someone do the work for you. I know me or Dennis too, if you sent something, probably be like, yep, you got everything. You're good to go. Cause I could quickly look at that right. real fast. Right. You're not asking me to listen to the song. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Don't do I have respect people's time and don't make them do something that is labor intensive or time intensive. It's just not, that's not a good way to build a relationship. <laughs> if you've built the relationship and especially we were talking about this earlier, if we can tell you're really trying and you're just, just wanting to make a hundred percent sure you got it right, but you've done all the homework. I mean, that takes five seconds to be like, yep, you got everything in order. Go ahead. Yeah. You know? So I think that's great. Is there any extra points within sync that you want to talk about before you guys have gotten a gem with this episode? I just want to say that if you're loving stuff like this, let me know. Would possibly love to do some more stuff or in different parts or even maybe do a live uh, show of it and let people ask questions, but that'd be cool. Let me know if you like this, but I've really enjoyed today. And I hope that if you're just getting into sync or if you are in sync and want to dive into other parts of the world, this will help you. And you can refer back to this episode at any time. But is there anything else you want to add? I mean, not really. I know we 
we talked a lot here, but don't be afraid to reach out to me. I won't speak for you. Don't, don't be afraid. You reach out. <laughs> if, you, if you don't do the things we talked about above and you treat me like a person, I love, I love friends. And as you can tell with the podcast, I want to help people. So yeah, I think yeah. be a good person. I, I, exactly. <laughs> Just be a good person. And it's funny because I think every podcast episode I've ever done with you, obviously, and other people, but like, I say, reach out to me. I don't care. I'll answer your questions if you look like you've done your own research first. You know, mm -hmm. if, you're, if your first question is, what company do I need to work with? Delete. You know, show you care. Show you're not just trying to use someone. Yep. You know, like that's that's it. That's it. That's that's it's that easy. You know. Mm -hmm. And I think we want everybody to succeed. The pool's big enough. The pool is definitely big enough. So, and also, you are going to work with all those people that rise up. So we obviously want you to do well if you're going to be in the long run. You know what I mean? So we're all going to hang out at the end of the day. Yep. So. Throwing yeah. up. Throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had opportunities and I literally said, if we get this placement, I'm going to throw up. So literally our new catchphrase every time we're like, we're going to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless. Oh, if people read our text, Dennis, yeah. they would think, what is wrong with these people? Weirdos. What is weirdos? Weirdo. Uh, or see the gifts, which I mean, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow. But yeah, nah. Today's been great. Today's been like a wealth. I hope everyone that's listening has just like taken all the notes. Feel free to go back and listen to any of this. And like I said, send us any questions after you've listened to this episode. And if we didn't cover something, let me know. So yeah, this was a great episode. Yeah. Thanks for being on, Dennis. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us this week on the Enlightened Musician podcast. Make sure to visit our website, theenlightenedmusician.com, where you can subscribe to the show on your platform of choice so you'll never miss an episode. Until next time, this is Lauren Light. <laughs>